I'm, uh, I'm Jorn. I'm currently based in Aston University, but um, this work has actually been done during like my internship and Charles' internship uh, in ARM. So um, most of it has been uh, done with them in collaboration with Emre, with Charles Leach, uh, with Ganesh, with uh, Jeff, and with Max. Um, here's a brief outline of, uh, of my talk today. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce to you the problem of actually counting occupants and occupancy estimation, since most of you are not uh, familiar necessarily with that particular application and some of the related work, or the main ways that people have uh, approached this problem, and what is the fundamentally different way in which we proposed and kind of like patented to solve it. Um, then I'm going to go through like what is uh, the data collection that we did, how we've evaluated the whole, uh, the whole system. I'm going to talk about also like two modeling state, like two types of modeling approaches that we took, uh, which are probably algorithmically quite different to what we saw today, because they're not going to be based on deep learning. And then we're going to move on to like the evaluation, which we report some formal accuracy, computational efficiency, feasibility checks, what you'd need to deploy. And we're going to conclude with um, actually fair amount of limitations and discussions of how we, what future work is needed uh, for this project. And this is obviously like, uh, can be subject to some future collaborations. OK, so what is the, pro the problem we're trying to solve is how do you estimate the room occupancy? There are two main ways in which people have tried to solve this problem, where the, the most, probably the most popular one is using like video cameras, which cost a lot of money, and usually deploy something like uh, some uh, convolutional neural nets or some other deep learning um, image recognition algorithm, where they detect essentially human silhouettes, and then we kind of like count how many, how many of those are there in an image. We're gonna, we're gonna like call th that sort of methods person counting sensors that cover the entire area of interest. Because essentially, the algorithm that you have, uh, you rely on having an advice that kind of like monitors everything that you can estimate. And then you have an algorithm that counts number of things uh, in it. And then there's like entirely different set of approaches that have been proposed, uh, which use not expensive, like the cameras are very accurate. The problem with them is that they're very expensive and sometimes cannot be used in real time and obviously can be problematic when, whenever you're dealing with crowds. Now, the second sort of approaches, they're cheap, but they're hard to install, and they rely on uh, simple sensors like uh, either pressure sensors or, or like passive infrared sensors. You place them essentially at the gates of the environment you're trying to, to monitor, like uh, for example, at the entries and the, and the exits you're hoping that you're going to be able to catch with a passive infrared sensor the direction of movement, and you're hoping that people are, will be coming one at a time or leaving one at a time. If they don't, things are complicated and they don't work, the systems don't work too much. And the problem is, is that also once you enter the building or the environment, you kind of like lose track of what, what's going on. So that can be quite problematic once you scale to larger buildings because uh, pretty much you get it wrong once and then you don't have a, a opportunity to correct for that mistake because unlike the first type of methods. There's obviously like a third, third approach which takes use of both, which essentially you have uh, passive infrared sensors attached to cameras and then those cameras like switch on only whenever there's like uh, sufficient motion or, or some gestures or some pattern. But that, that sort of like expensive security systems are typically uh, mostly used in kind of like military applications or, or, or like for the police or, or, or that sort of thing. And we're not going to really talk about them because they're more expensive than the first group. What we're going to suggest here and what we will try to convince you that you should consider doing is using a passive infrared sensor, so a simple cheap sensor. We use it in the category of a person, person counting sensor. So instead of just like scratching the surface and count, counting how many people are passing through a gate, can you use this, actually, instead of a camera, compensating with a, essentially a different setup of machine learning algorithms that you use to analyze this data? So just to kind of like show you, for those of you that are not familiar, the passive infrared sensors are simple motion sensors. Um, and they have, they have like some field of view of like 100 degrees, uh, uh, 100 de degrees top view, and then horizontal view of 82 degrees, 5 meter detection range. And they pretty much flicker around whenever there is motion. 
So if you look at the uh, passive infrared analog setting sensor for 30 seconds, you'd see something like that, where the bumps up and down increase, like the variance increases whenever you have more motion, and it's kind of like it's nearly stationary whenever there, there's less motion in front of the sensor. Okay, so if we manage to do that using a single passive infrared sensor instead of a camera that monitors some environment, if we manage to kind of like make a useful occupancy detect uh, counting system from it, the advantages would be that this will be very, uh, very cheap. So this, because a passive infrared sensor costs like one or two dollars or something like that. Uh, the other big advantage, uh, it was mentioned earlier in another talk, is that it's non-invasive. We really like whenever we're deploying, deploying monitoring systems in the wild, in offices or in our houses, we really want this not to take a picture of us every time we go to the bathroom or, uh, or go to um, switch offices or we, we're on Facebook or, or, or whatever. And the third thing is that they're also very easy to install. Like, like the cameras, you just place that system, like uh, we, we demonstrate that we just place the system inside of the room and then we do our stuff, unlike uh, the passive infrared sensors that require quite sophisticated installation actually at the gates in order to work. And obviously there's gonna be uh, some challenges that we need to consider and we don't completely solve in, the, in this work. And this is kind of like, is it gonna matter? Is it gonna be dependent on what is the room that you're using to collect the data? Um, what are you gonna be doing when there's like multiple occupants uh, occluding each other's view to the sensor? Also, is there gonna be like a maximum number of occupancy that you'll be able to detect with that sort of approach? Like if the crowd is too big, will one sensor still work? And that sort of thing. And then there's like um, probably the biggest problem is that I would like to point out that we're trying to estimate occupancy from motion. So there's like a high problem of latency here that we, we're not directly counting neither heads nor anything. We're kind of like trying to do a sophisticated part pattern recognition task. So okay, let's start with how we actually did the, the, the whole setup. So we have like an arm bed, arm embed with like a uh, touch passive infrared sensor which is like connected to a laptop uh, just for the power purposes and you place it around different offices in actually in the ARM Cambridge uh, sites. Uh, we obviously asked for consent and then we traveled or like switched around different rooms, different meetings in order to collect data from meetings from, uh, from, from with different nature like whiteboard sessions, uh, formal setup uh, meetings, slide presentations, shared conference calls and, and that sort of things. Um, and we also vary the, the location depending on sunlight, uh, occupancy capacity, and that sort of thing. We collect about 75 meetings, but only 65 of them were actually usable because kind of like people push the sensor, they break stuff, it's, uh, it was a mess. At the, end of, at the end of the day, about 53 meetings, 53 hour recording was the clean, uh, trustworthy data. The rest was kind of like, I, I, I decided to exclude it just because I wasn't 100% sure what am I recording. And I'll sit down in front of the room for each of those things and count how many people are going in and coming out. Where the, th the, the, the thing is that to be fair, we're kind of like not using the data from when a person is coming in or coming out, because then it gets too easy and then we can get even higher accuracy. We're just hoping, can we recognize how many people are there based on their motion patterns rather than on the opening of the door or not, which creates a significant indicator of is there a change in, in occupancy. So okay, so let's see how kind of like a, a, a glance at how the data looked like is like, for example, you'd have for 30 seconds data. If you have zero people, we get something like the purple line here, which hardly moves at all, and there's no, no variation. Then the green line den denotes two people. You see that kind of like it's nearly stationary, then it jumps, then it's stationary again. And then for nine people, you see more variation, and then once people get more than nine, it, it becomes uh, even more varying. So we kind of like, notice that there is a general trend, that the more variation there is in the output, that, that there's gonna be like more occupants. This becomes even clearer as you take like a longer window of uh, passive infrared data. If you take 25 minutes, for example, you see that the, the, green, the green signal is from nine people, the red one is from two people, so I can probably safely say that the more variation is there, uh, there is in the signal, there's gonna be more occupants. The question is how accurate is that, that gonna be? How, how much can I quantify that? So what I did is, okay, just a simple mathematical check. What is the distribution of that raw data? Just do a histogram of it. 
And then we see kind of like that that's a textbook Laplace distribution. That the date, uh, like at the top, you can see that for 45 minutes, if, as long as I take a longer duration of data, it's a nearly textbook like Laplace distribution with a spike at one, which is only due to the saturations of the sensor because this, the passive infrared sensor is saturated at values of one. And then one, once you start reducing the, the amount of data that you're using, the data is less perfectly Laplace distributed, but still kind of like we can see that fitting a Laplace distribution to this data is going to work quite well. Furthermore, I want you to, to, to point out that notice that the position of that Laplace distribution, essentially the distribution I'm fitting, it stays the same, and it's only the variation of the data that kind of changes. So if we just do a, a simple linear regression and kind of like plot the spread parameters of that Laplace distribution against the number of people, we can kind of see a nearly linear trend. You see, we just a log linear trend towards the end. So we were like kind of happy because we were like, oh, we nearly solved it. We, it looks like just based on that spread parameter value, which is a single feature, we can kind of predict how many people were there in the room for that duration of time, uh, where the location parameter, as you can see, it's hardly useful at all. Well, and and that, that was just a simple uh, linear, linear prediction problem where to be even more accurate, you can split it, you can, you can stratify to like a linear problem for spread parameter values in that range and then a log linear problem where you have a stochastic switching principle whenever the spread parameter values are in an interval 0.8, north, north 0.1. Okay, but the problem that we had is that the Laplace parameters that you saw there each one of those stars was estimated from about 100,000 data points. That's the passive infrared data for a whole duration of, a, of one hour. And you don't want to wait one hour to receive a real life occupancy estimation of uh, what was going on in the room. So what we want to do is can, we want to see how does the performance changes as we start looking at data not for one hour durations but for smaller durations of like 30 seconds or two minutes. Ideally, you want the spread parameter value, which is your single feature that you use for prediction, to stay constant, to stay the same. But in red, I've plotted the spread parameter value without doing anything of that raw data. And you can see that for the same eating, same, same count of people, it doesn't stay the same. Like here you have two minutes, every two minutes I'm, I'm, I'm estimating that feature, and it kind of bubbles around, which means that my system is gonna be predicting different number of people in the room, although they stay the same. And it's, in fact, even the same office meeting. Once you switch to 30 seconds, uh, feedback every 30 seconds, th things get even messier. The blue line fixes it, but I'll go to that on, on the next slide. So now, what we noticed, uh, what we realized, uh, which was also mentioned earlier, is that one, when, when things are stationary, when, when nothing's happening in the room, you can kind of like quite clearly predict how, what is the occupancy based on motion. The problem is when things are going on, like when there are things happening in the room, what do we do? And we were like, we were thinking, a natural way really is just to segment the raw data so that you kind of like know when something's happening and when something's not happening. And we were looking for, okay, can I just look at the segments in which nothing's happening pretty much, and it's just things are nice and calm, and use this data for the prediction, and the rest of the data ignore or filter out. Then the mathematical problem was, how do I do that? Um, and we came up with like a Bayesian, like a tradition, some sort of a traditional, but also like a novel contribution uh, towards that end, and it was based on uh, advances in Bayesian non-parametrics, in particular Bayesian non-parametrics infinite hidden mark models which you essentially train on the data and they kind of like automatically learn how many clusters are there in the data. And the points that are close, close in the same states, in the same clusters, are gonna follow like more similar dynamics and the ones that are indifferent look different. Essentially in this particular case, you can see that the red points are significantly more varying than the blue and the, and the green. And the nice thing about it is that you do it in a completely unsupervised way. I don't need to know what the people are doing within the room. I just kind of like detect how many different regimes of movement are there in the room without any prior information about it. Then question was, how do we kind of like automatically say all the time which are gonna be the behaviors of like normal, normal movement and which are gonna be like high variance movement or, or like very involved movement? Well, the simple thing really to do is to kind of like deploy the system in the different rooms when nothing's going on. There's not even a single person there what are the clusters that I'm, I'm gonna pick up? In this particular picture, those are gonna be the, the green clusters and the, and the blue clusters. Then, 
if I kind of like deploy the system in occupied rooms, I'm kind of like ensured that those two clusters, because they're trained on that, on that data as well, they're gonna be less variant than the new clusters that will occur. In this particular picture is, uh, is the red cluster. So then it's kind of enough to say, look at the data and don't really consider the red cluster. Because when there's a red cluster, there's too much going on for me to kind of like translate, it, uh, translate motion into occupancy. Ignore it and just focus on the remaining uh, green and blue clusters here. So once you do that, you can kind of like estimate again that simple feature, Laplace spread parameter, based on every two seconds or even every 30 seconds of data. Now that's gonna be plotted in, in, in blue on both plots. What we observed is that clearly, although the problem is not 100% solved, you can kind of see that your spread parameter values for each meeting uh, and for any occupancy level barely changes throughout the, the different windows. So it means that even if you're not 100% accurate of what is gonna be the occupancy estimation level, you're gonna really be logical about it and you're not gonna be switching, uh, you're not gonna be switching the occupancy count every time someone like walks out or sneezes or, or does something uh, that involves more movement. So in order to kind of like quantify that, what we did is we did, first we did a box plot of like, okay, let's assume I don't filter any data and I just fit the raw, feed the raw data to the system, estimate a single feature, and use this feature coupled with a linear regression to kind of like predict the occupancy level. So if I just plot the data, and I'm waiting like 45 minutes, so I'm giving feedback on every 45 minutes, I'm using data from 45 minutes essentially in one go, you can see a clearly linear trend, everything's 100% predictable with where the crosses here are essentially data that does not, is not described by my model. So when there are many crosses, it's a back thing. When there's no crosses, it means my data is nice and I can predict everything 100% pretty much. So for 45 minutes, you see that with, without filtering, I do very well, uh, linear trend. But once I go into kind of like, num that's the number of people and that's the spread parameter values. Once I go into like e feedback every 30 seconds and analyzing data uh, 30 seconds at a time, you can see that without filtering, any behavior without actually segmenting the behavior uh, of, of the people in the room into different regimes, we do pretty bad. We start like our data no longer uh, can describe, like our system no longer can kind of like fit the framework of what's going on and we pretty much fail on 30 seconds. Now let's assume that I actually use that sort of uh, suggested, uh, suggested segmentation approach. We see that for 45 minutes we do, well, still pretty, pretty well. Um, still pretty well for 45 uh, minute observation time, which makes sense. And then once we reduce to uh, 30, 30 seconds observation time, it's not great, but you can, you, you, you still, you, st you st see a significant improvement where furthermore the crosses here occur only at the, at the first and at the last like occupancy levels, which kind of makes sense because uh, essentially means that your system would be outputting, there's too many people now for me to be accurate or there's like, zero or less people, so I'm, I'm gonna be, so as long as it's at the border edges, you kind of like have nice interoperability. Now let's quantify that in, in terms of accuracy. We're gonna measure what is the percentage accuracy of your system outputting an occupancy level that's within one of the true, or in the, or in the brackets within two occupants of the, true, of, of the true occupancy. And we see that if we're just using the raw data and we're not doing any filtering, for 20 minutes, both methods are quite comparable. But then once you start reducing, increasing, like reducing the window size and giving feedback quicker and quicker and quicker, not doing any segmentation, behavior segmentation gets worse and worse and worse while doing essentially behavioral segmentation keeps some, some sort of robustness where you can still not provide the same level of accuracy that video, uh, video based systems provide where you're here at a very cheap price. Now, Next stage was like, okay, that's all nice. It looks like a nice idea, but you're gonna say, how do I deploy that? Can I actually make the training work online on a microcontroller, uh, on a microcontroller board that doesn't have any memory or any CPU time? Well, if you use traditional training algorithms for uh, infinite hidden mark moles or any sort of probabilistic moles, which rely on MCMC sampling or on variational base, stochastic variational inference, gradient based descent algorithms, it doesn't work. 
you're requiring about 100 to 200 iterations just to, just to fit your behavioral segmentation model, which, which means that you're gonna be too slow and you're not gonna be able to run it on board. So we suggest that the iterative map approach, which is kind of like greedy, but it's still gonna, we, we think it's gonna, it does good enough job in terms of mean absolute error, almost the same in fact, but in six iterations. Furthermore, we, we noticed that if we train using a traditional approach offline the system and then we deploy with a greedy, a greedy algorithm on the microcontroller board during the inference, we're actually not losing any accuracy. So then the next stage, uh, uh, what, 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 what in fact Charlie did is he, he implemented this in C++ and we put the iterative map al algorithm to work online continuously on the uh, on ARM embed boards. So we used uh, Cortex-M0 board and Cortex-M4F. So one has, so they both have like uh, different memory and different clock speed. What well, we note uh, here, the purpose of the exercise is to see, okay, how long does it take to analyze to cluster data of 30 seconds? And how long is your battery, a normal battery, is gonna live if, if you're working continuously all the time? What well, we notice is that Cortex-M0 we, we, we do not claim that the algorithm has been optimized as much as possible, but we've tried to do as, uh, quite a lot of mathematical optimization uh, on my side and also like implementation optimization. We notice that the Cortex-M0 -M uh, platform does process segments data of 30 seconds for 95 seconds. So that means that you're not gonna be able to cluster the data before the new data comes along. But then the Cortex-M4F clusters it in 1.15 seconds, mainly because of uh, its floating point capabilities and this is fast enough and we can actually even increase the feedback time to less than 30 seconds. Furthermore, we notice that the life of the, like the Cortex M, uh, M4F is, is, will need to change its battery to recharge it only once every 36 days, which we thought that essentially once a month for an office environment, it's quite a feas feasible setup. We had a demo, but um, unfortunately I didn't bring it today because um, it's too many people for it to work. So. Um, just to conclude with some future directions, uh, we're planning on one thing that would be very interesting is to see how can you do, how can you develop this system to work with more than just a single passive infrared sensor. Can you use other non-invasive sensors such as CO2 sensors? All the algorithms would, would stay the same most likely, but there would be some additional calibration in order to improve the accuracy and in order to make like a, like a separate product out of it. Then we also, can extend the system. I actually have done some trials on that using more advanced switching dynamical models rather than HMMs, things like non-parametric switching linear dynamical system or switching autoregressive models. Then you can actually capture particular gestures like entering the room, exiting the room, or like some hand waving and that sort of thing uh, with quite high accuracy and use them in different ways depending whether, whether you need occupancy or you need uh, some emergency thing or detecting walking or not or whatever. And then we also, uh, can the, the work can be extended if we test different PAR sensors at different locations, maybe place it at the ceiling, maybe play, place one at the wall, and see how kind of like if we use two sensors at the same time that have filled the view towards the room, are we, how much are we gonna improve the accuracy? And that's it for me, and here's some uh, uh, work we've published on the topic. Um, on bottom is algorithms, top is the actual work we did with uh, EMRA. Thank you.